Good evening. I'm Misha Galperin, Chief Executive Officer of the National Museum of American Jewish History, located on the Independence Mall in Philadelphia, the birthplace of the United States of America. Welcome to tonight's virtual program for the love of opera, celebrating RBG's 88th birthday. Over the past 12 months, we have become a virtual museum. We have presented over 50 virtual programs and five new virtual exhibitions during this past year, and we have reached nearly 1 million people. Many of you among them. We're so grateful for your support and participation tonight and throughout the past year, and to have the chance to be connected outside of the four walls of our theater. So tonight's program presented with our wonderful partners, Opera Philadelphia and UCLA's Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience, we're thrilled to welcome thousands of new names and faces to our extended museum family. We and all the partners look forward to staying in touch and welcoming you back for all the superb programs planned this spring. It was September of 2019, before this difficult year of lockdowns, loss, hardship, and hurt, that we hosted the longtime member and supporter of the museum, the notorious RBG herself, in our building and had the induction ceremony to bring her into our Ed Snyder Only in America Gallery and Hall of Fame. Oh, what an evening it was. Justice Ginsburg is the very definition of why this institution was built, to tell the stories of Jewish Americans who have been the beneficiaries of the opportunities this country afforded them and who have contributed to building a more perfect union. As she told us during her induction, she had a sign in her office, which is a quote from the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, Tzedek Tzedek Terdof, justice, justice you shall pursue, and she did. But she was also a lover of the arts and of opera in particular, a passion which allowed her to stop thinking about her cases and think about law and opera. She shared this passion with her ideological opposite on the court, Justice Antonin Scalia, proof that Americans are capable of being friends and compatriots even when they disagree in politics. And so tonight, we remember her through her favorite arias, recorded in our own Dell Theater and in Los Angeles just for this occasion. It is what the Jewish tradition teaches us. We say of those who passed away, let her memory be for a blessing. She has blessed us with her wisdom and courage and with her love of opera. Just a few words of housekeeping before we begin. The program will last about an hour. We would appreciate donations to support our institution so we can continue to bring you programs like this one. $18 or more if you'd like. Another way to support the museum is to shop in our store. We currently have a store-wide sale on RBG items. Tonight's attendees will get an RBG keychain free with purchase using the code birth, birthday one through Wednesday. Look for links to all of these in the chat and comments and on the event page. You're in for a great treat. And to guide you through, let me introduce you to our host for the evening, stage director, tenor, director of opera UCLA, and by the way, a recovering attorney, someone who shares RBG's passion for the law as well as opera, Peter Cazares, who put a lot of his time and expertise into putting together tonight's event. Do Google him. And before I turn it over to him, I want to thank our own Dan Samuels for an incredible piece of work that he's done to put this and all of our other programs together this year. Peter, welcome and thanks. Thank you so much, Misha, and welcome everybody. I'm Peter Cazares, Director of Opera at UCLA and your host for this evening's special tribute to the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on what would have been her 88th birthday. It's an honor and a pleasure to join this event, which is a, a co-partnership between the National Museum of American Jewish History, Opera Philadelphia, the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience, and the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. I promise we'll only say those four together one more time at the end. 
uh, and I teach at UCLA. So it's a special pleasure for me to be part of this team. When I was attending performances at the Glimmerglass Festival a few years ago, I was privileged to hear Justice Gin Ginsburg give one of her wonderful talks where she would introduce opera arias by the thread of linking them to a particular legal issue that was came up in the in the aria and you'll hear more about this later uh, in uh, when Francesca Zambello gives her tribute but for now let me just say that the spirit of RBG inspired our choices for this evening's selections they all either have to do with a specific legal concept or they are sung by a character who's a particular favorite of the justice so we will start with the wonderful aria Una Furtiva Lagrima followed by remarks from Eileen Strempel, Dean of the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, as well as the superstar tenor Lawrence Brownlee, a friend of the late justice. In Una Furtiva Lagrima, the peasant Nemorino realizes that his beloved Adina, whom he thinks does not care for him, probably does love him, and not just proven by a preponderance of the evidence, but it is surely proof beyond a reasonable doubt that he realizes in this aria because he sees a tear down her cheek because she is jealous of the other village girls who have been paying attention to Nemorino. Of course, they've been paying attention because they've just found out he's a millionaire, but that's, you know, that's opera. Um, another legal issue in this uh, opera is that Adina has just bought Nemorino out of his contract to serve in the military. So to perform this wonderful piece that many of you will recognize, we have the rising young tenor, the wonderful Joshua Blue, accompanied by Grant Lanick, head of music staff at Opera Philadelphia. So now let's have Una Furtiva Lagrima. Oh, oh, oh. 
Good evening, my name is Eileen Strumpel, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve as the inaugural dean of the Herb Alpert School of Music at UCLA. And on behalf of everyone here, I want to welcome you to the spectacular event made possible through a wonderful collaboration between Opera Philadelphia and the National Museum of American Jewish History. This event is a very special one on the anniversary of RBG's birthday. And uh, when I was a little girl, uh, growing up in upstate New York, one of the summer treats was that we would go to Glimmerglass Opera. And I would oftentimes see her strolling the grounds, either between the acts or sometimes even between the opera. She would come and, like many folks, go to the opera in the morning and again, then again in the evening. And I was just so inspired by her as a little girl, inspired by her love of opera. Um, I myself ended up pursuing opera singing as a career for a long time. But I also just deeply admired her feminist leanings, which also perhaps inspired my uh, pursuit of and study of music by American women composers. And I also was deeply impressed by her long-standing, lifelong commitments to social justice and to the power of education. So on behalf of UCLA, UCLA Opera, and the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience, I want to thank you for being here and enjoy the show. Hello, my name is Lawrence Brownlee. I'm an operatic tenor and also an artistic advisor at Opera Philadelphia. I had the great pleasure of knowing the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's someone that I considered a friend and someone that inspired me so much. I have several lasting memories of Justice Ginsburg. Uh, the two that stand out more than anything is the first being when she invited me to take part in the music hall at the Supreme Court in which she hosted. Uh, I spent an afternoon singing to many of the retired justices and the sitting justices, so I got a chance to meet several of her colleagues, past and present, and so this for me was a big uh, joy of that afternoon. I got a chance to have lunch seated right next to Justice Ginsburg, and we talked about so many things. We talked about her life, her work, we talked about my life and music and how much she had a great passion for it. I knew that her favorite opera was Der Rosen Cavalier. She told me that uh, she was quite opinionated about the things she liked and the things that she didn't like. And so we sat there and we talked the whole time. I remember her being so interested in me and uh, my career and uh, genuinely wanting to know what it was like to be an opera singer. And so that meant a lot to me, someone that I admired so much because of her work and her commitment to so many wonderful causes. I was inspired by the fact that she had a great interest and passion for music. And I know that she had starred as an extra on the stage, her and the, also the late uh, Justice Scalia. And so she had a great passion for the craft of being on stage as well. And the second memory is when I got a chance to be co-star to her at uh, the Washington National Opera in a production called The Daughter of the Regiment. She had a speaking role, uh, but she had so much enthusiasm and passion for doing that role. You know her of her great work and her long lasting legacy that will never be forgotten. Uh, but for me in my heart, I remember after having her having performed that role to be able to walk out on stage and to receive all the adulation and the bravas uh, that she often saw that the opera singers get when we're on stage, uh, she got a chance to experience that. And so I had the great honor to escort her out for her bow and the audience erupted. 
She was so giddy and happy to do it. And I just remember her, that smile, that unforgettable smile she had uh, when she was taking that bow. And so for me, that is a present that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. And even as I do some of the things that are important to me, some of the social issues that I am interested in, that I am passionate about, I try to tap into the things that uh, I saw her do and the things that she fought for, of course, women's rights and, you know, equality rights for everyone. And so I'm inspired by her life, her legacy, and she's someone that I will always look to her story and what she accomplished and what she believed in to inspire me and fuel me for the things that I want to accomplish in my life. So this is in great tribute to my dear friend, uh, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so I hope she rests in peace. Thank you so much, Larry Brownlee and Eileen Strempel. <clears throat> and thank you, Josh Blue, for a wonderful, wonderful performance of Una Furtiva Lagrima. It was just great. And Grant Lanick, it's always a pleasure to hear you play. You are the best. And I have worked with Grant, so I can tell you he is the best. Now we have a wonderful treat, and it's especially a treat for me because Gianni Schicchi is one of my favorite, favorite operas because it is perfect. There is not one note that goes astray. It is Puccini's only comedy, and it is a joy from start to finish. Now, in this piece, uh, the old miser Buozo Donati has died, and he has written a will in which he leaves everything to the monks, or pretty much everything. And so his family, who are impoverished and really greedy, are not happy about this. And they come to, they get Johnny Skiki, who's a local, what shall I say, Mr. Fix-It. And they try to convince him to fix the will, even though uh, Bozo Donati has died. And Skiki eventually does it. And he does it because his daughter pleads and begs with him to do this because she wants to marry Renuccio. And Johnny Skiki is like, no, I don't want you to marry into this stupid family with these ridiculous people but she does those things that only a daughter can do. And she ends up twisting her dad right around her little finger. Um, so the legal issue here, of course, is falsification of a will for which you get, as they say repeatedly in the, um, in the script, you will get your hand cut off if you do that. And you would have to then be banished from Florence waving your bloody stump. So we avoid that. But it is true that Dante, when he referred to uh, Johnny Skiki, he consigned him to one of the rings of hell for his, uh, for his shenanigans. However, it's all in the, the name of love. I, I think it's pretty good. It's not a bad thing. And maybe hell isn't really so bad. Anyway, here we have um, Ashley Marie Robillard and Grant Lanick, followed by something really special. Um, this was an interview which we have in two parts which I call Growing Up Ginsburg. And it is uh, my talking last week with Jane and Jim Ginsburg, the children of the late justice. And I wanna give a specific thanks to my dear friend and colleague, Kevin Burdett, who acted as a sort of Yenta the matchmaker to make this possible so that I could speak with these two wonderful, wonderful people about their mother. It's a really special treat. And so now let's have Omio Babino Caro.
We're here with Jane and Jim Ginsburg, and thank you very much for joining us to discuss your mother. We know that she had this uh, framed uh, Torah portion in her chambers, justice, justice, you shall pursue. Was there any particular religious component of that as part of your growing up or as part of your nurturing when you were younger? Uh, not a religious component. Uh, uh, we were not observant. We had uh, somewhat minimal Hebrew schooling, uh, but certainly a very strong uh, ethnic and uh, cultural component. And I think the lifelong love of learning, for example, definitely comes from that uh, Jewish tradition. When she came to the National Museum of American Jewish History, she spoke about the story of uh, a century ago when Henrietta Schult was, um, uh, her mother died and Chaim Peretz offered to say Kaddish for her mother because a man was the person who was supposed to say Kaddish and how Henrietta Schult had said, no, this is something that I have to do on behalf of my own family and how Justice Ginsburg obviously approved of that. And I wonder if, you know, if you can say anything about her what she felt about some of the Jewish issues having to do with equality of men and women. Well, I do know that uh, she was very, I, I think uh, an important moment uh, for her was the discovery when her mother passed away that she could not be part of the minion to say Kaddish. I think that really made an impression and obviously a poor one. <laughs> And, and even before that, she recounted how in her neighborhood uh, in Brooklyn, when uh, somebody Jewish died, uh, men would go s uh, scouring the neighborhood looking for Jewish men to serve on the minion. There was no shortage of women, but they didn't count. Right. And that's something that she that registered with her uh, even when she she was quite young. So I just, I have to, this leads me to ask this question, where did she get it from? Where, if her parents were not, I mean, where did she get this passionate commitment to equality? Was she perhaps just chosen in some weird spiritual way that it, she was the one? Because she was the one who did it. I don't think she would have ever seen, her, seen herself like that. Of course not. Uh, I think much, I think she got a lot of it from her mother uh, because her mother was uh, very intelligent, very talented, uh, and uh, very, uh, I don't, frustrated is not the right word. It, it, it's not that, it, not frustrated in the emotional sense, but frustrated in the sense of opportunities denied that, right. uh, in her, in her mother's family, uh, there were uh, uh, girls and boys, uh, but the, um, the boy was the one that got to go to college. Uh, and her mother had to fight to graduate high school. So she went to high school day and night, graduating at 15, before she had to go work in the garment center to make money so her brother could go to college. Uh, and uh, so the, the message that I think her mother received was that girls don't count. And I don't think that she wanted her daughter to, to suffer the, the same denials. Right. right. Wow. That's, uh, that's incredible. I mean, and also to think of what uh, people from that generation must have gone through just to re-establish re themselves and over here, as you know, I mean, uh, she she is part of the um, the Hall of Fame, the only in America Hall of Fame at the National Museum of Jewish American History, of American Jewish History, pardon me. Um, and that is, it really makes us wonder about the, you know, things we complain about nowadays a whole different it's a whole different ball game mom, so used, to, mom used to say that uh that her goal in life was to be everything her mother could have been had she grown up in an era when women were as valued as men 
I want to thank Jane and Jean Ginsburg for that the time they spent. And they'll be coming back in a few minutes to talk with me more about her, their mother and opera. So now we have another wonderful treat. Uh, we welcome the American baritone Norman Garrett, who has fantastic stories to tell about his times meeting Justice Ginsburg. Uh, he'll also be singing the aria Ajavinta la causa from the marriage of Figaro um, uh, in between his remarks. Now I should say in this aria, this is, a, this is a huge legal component. In this aria, Count Almaviva wants to make sure that the judicial proceeding, which is happening in the other room right now, comes out the way he wants it to. And that judicial proceeding is that Figaro must either pay Marcellina the money he owes her, which the Count knows he can't do because he's always broke, or he will have to marry her because he borrowed money for her. So this is a, a, a suit by Marcellina for specific payment and uh, uh, to, for specific uh, payment of either he has to pay her the money or he has to marry her. O pagarla o sposarla, as the lawyer Don Curzio says. Now, this is before it is revealed that Marcellina is in fact Figaro's mother. And Don Bartolo is Figaro's father. That's a whole other story. But let us just say it is this revelation that causes Don Curzio, the lawyer in the piece, to point out repeatedly and emphatically, they cannot get married. He says it about 2,600 times. Thank you, Don Curzio. All right, so now we have uh, Norman Garrett Baritone and Grant Lenick will be performing the aria, but first let's hear from Norman Garrett. Hello, uh, my name is Norman Garrett. I'm here today to talk to you about the great Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I'll never forget, uh, first time I saw her, we did our annual opera ball at Washington National Opera and it was at the Japanese Embassy, first of all, which is gorgeous. It was beautifully set up, beautiful. It's one of my favorite memories from DC. Anyway, I just sang a um, concert, you know, I'm talking to everybody, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I turn around, there's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I'm like, is that, is that who I think it is? And before I could even figure that out, she has one of her friend aides come over to get me and to, so I could talk to her. And I was like, wait, wait, what? And I remember our first conversation, you know, we just talked about like opera, what I was doing, what I had coming up in the season that year. And, you know, just a very like sense of camaraderie and, 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 and friendship that she was able to like get out of me, even though I was trying my best not to be, you know, weird, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, gee, you know, trying to freak out. But so my wife, Catherine Martin, the mezzo, fabulous mezzo, uh, was singing in the rain cycle down at Washington National Opera at the Kennedy Center. And um, I got tickets to go see all the shows. Um, and I can't remember which opera it was, but it was intermission. And I was sitting there talking with like a bunch of people that I knew, a bunch of people that I recognized. And I'm sitting there and the artistic administrator of the company runs up to me sweating out of breath. And I'm like, what's going on? And he was like, no, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wants to talk to you. And I was like, what? You know, I had been gone for a while, you know? And I was like, what? And she saw me at intermission walk out of the thing and went up to the Russian lounge, which is where everybody would hang out between intermissions and went up to the Russian lounge and then had someone come and find me so we could have a conversation. And, you know, I rush up the stairs and then by the time I get to her, I'm sweating and awkward too. And, you know, we just started talking and she, I never will forget it. It's, I, she knew about, about, more about my schedule and my career than I knew. Like she was telling me, she was keeping track of the young artists at Washington National Opera. I'm not the only person who has this like relationship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but she knew where I was singing next. She knew where my wife was singing next. She knew everything about us. She had done some research. And that in itself is quite an honor considering, you know, what she's balancing with the Supreme Court that she could take the time and, and, and do this with me. 
And I I just, the sense of pride and like joy that I have that like Ruth Bader Ginsburg went out of her way to like have a conversation with me. Hai già vinta la causa, cosa sento? In quell'accio io cadea. Perfidi, io voglio, io voglio di tal mano punirvi. A piacer mio la sentenza sarà. Se pagasse la vecchia pretendente, pagarla in qual maniera? E poi Antonio, che ha un incognito figlio ricusa di dare una nipote in matrimonio. O ti vando l'orgoglio di questo mentecato. Tutto ciò vanrà giro. Il corpo è fatto. Vedrò mentre io sospiro, felice un servo mio. in van desio e posto del dovrà vedrò per man d'amore un dito al viglio cetto chi in me destò un affetto che per me poi non ha che per me poi non ha vedrò mentre io sospiro Felice un servo mio, vedrò che in ben giro desio e i poseder dovrà. Vedrò per man d'amore, unita un vile accetto, chi in me destò un affetto, che per me poi non ha, che per me poi non ha. Vedrò, 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 vedrò. Hanno lasciato in pace, non ho questo contento. Tu non scesti audace, tu non scesti audace. Per dare a me tormento, e forse ancora per ridere, per ridere di mia infelicità. Già la speranza sola delle vendette mie, questa anima consola, e giubilar mi fa, e giubilar, e giubilar mi fa. Ah, che lasciarti in pace, non vo questo contento, tu non nascesti audace, Per dare a me tormento, e fosse ancora per ridere, per ridere di mia infelicità. Già la speranza sola delle vendette mie, quest'anima consola, e giubilar mi fa, e giubilar, e giubilar mi fa, e giubilar, e giubilar mi fa, e giubilar mi fa,
I was doing something at Glimmerglass. She also had some affiliation with Glimmerglass too. She would pop up there and 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 visit. And she had a really close uh, relationship with Francesca Zambello, the director of uh, Washington National Opera. And I remember I was outside. You know, it always happened like a dream. It's like you never get used to seeing Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, I was sitting outside. It was hot, and um, uh, I heard people whispering, and I'm like, "What? What?" I look up. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I was like, "Oh my gosh!" I, I, you know, I just saw her like a couple of months ago, and I'm talking to them, and she stops, and again, she has someone come get me to talk to me, and I'm with all my friends, so you know, I feel so cool i mean you feel cool every time and you know we talk and we have a little chat and she was like i'm really excited to see you in your part you're doing this summer and i think i was doing like maybe jake and porgy and bess or something like that she was like i'm really excited to see you this summer and i, I love your work and just these beautiful words coming out of her mouth at me and i'll never forget after one of the after one of the performances we uh, all went to francesca's uh, house big beautiful like wood uh it's gorgeous and uh you know i'm just sitting on a couch with ruth bader ginsburg next to me and we're just having this casual conversation about you know she was always interested in what i was doing you know she was always interested in you know my uh artistic you know endeavors and uh i just you know, she's had that way, which we all know, of making people feel so special and so important. Um, and that's the gift that she gave me, you know. Uh, I walked away from that night and just, you know, I, we took a selfie on the couch. I mean, come, come on, you know, it's just... I felt so fortunate to have had so many interactions with her and so many like really like intimate moments, you know, she some like she would write my wife and I like little letters on the like Supreme Court, like official papers, you know, and like, you know, handwritten letters to us and like with the dates and, you know, like she went out of her way to to me, it felt like she was going way out of her way to make a lot of us just feel special and like feel like what we were doing was important. And I think that was the beauty, the, that was the, that's what made her a titan, was that ability to do that. And I think I'm gonna say that um, all of the memories that I have and that other people have of her at Washington National Opera um, are blessings and um, I'll hold on to them for the rest of my life. And uh, that's my story about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and how much I love her. Uh, thank you all for listening. And, you know, hey, hail the queen. I want to thank Norm especially for that. It's so charming. And you know, I've spent a lot of my life with singers and they really know how to tell a story, I have to say. Um, and one of the things that Norm talks about, he talks about this quality that Ruth Bader Ginsburg have. I mean, you know, it's sort of like you're meeting the Queen or Michelle Obama or Beyonce or Jesse Norman or Birgit Nielsen. I mean, she was one of those people whom you never get over the fact of, oh, it's her, it's her, it's she's the one, she's right there. She's really small and she's right there. So move carefully. But what was great about her, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was she realized this and she got you over the hump very quickly and without any fuss because she just immediately came to the matter at hand. And it is indeed, it was always cool to talk with her. I was lucky to do so several times. So I, I wanna thank Norm especially for that beautiful performance and for those lovely memories. Uh, our next aria is In Uomini in Soldati, In Men, In Soldiers, from the opera Così Fan Tutte by Mozart, which is translated as So Do All Women. Slightly problematic, but that's okay. Um, this aria is sung by Despina, who is the very shrewd, intelligent, 
self-actualized woman uh, and represented a particular kind of female character that Justice Ginsburg really, really liked. Um, she was, in fact, especially beloved by Justice Ginsburg. So she asked the two sisters, Fiordaligi and Dorabella, if they really think that they can trust men, especially men who are soldiers. She's basically saying, come on, come on, grow up. You know better than that. We're going to hear Ashley Marie Robillard and Grant Lanick, followed by part two of my interview with Jane and Jim Ginsburg, uh, which deals with a subject dear to all of our hearts. So now let's hear In Uomini in Soldati. So I wanted to switch a little bit. I was so interested to hear on one of your other interviews that on your father's side, your grandmother's father's job was to raise and lower the curtain at the opera house in Odessa, <laughs> which is that means it really must sort of be in your blood uh, to some to, to some extent. Um, I'm wondering, you've talked a lot about what your mother's path was in opera and how she adored various composers switching between Don Giovanni and, Mo and Marriage of Figaro. I have to say I come down on the Marriage of Figaro side, but that's okay. Um, uh, I wanted to ask from someone who has been in the audience when your mother made her appearance at Glimmerglass, at Wolf Trap, um, at the Kennedy Center, I wanted to know what it was like from your point of view to go with her to any of those events where it always seemed it was pretty carefully, especially at the Kennedy Center, she was brought in, the lights would go down, she was brought in from house right and she would cross a, across in front of everybody. And I was there for a dress rehearsal of Don Giovanni or a performance of Don Giovanni at what would have been one of her last appearances there. And it, she was a rock star. The entire audience stood up and screamed 
and cry, you know, because she represented something and uh, which we felt we needed. And uh, I'm wondering what it was like for you to go with her to any of these events and what, what that must have been like on the, on the offstage side. James? Well, uh, it was certainly uh, interesting to come into Thunderous Applause. I remember, I don't know why it stuck with me in particular, at Santa Fe Opera, which was one of our opera stops in the summer. Um, she would come in and, as you say, everybody would stand up and start applauding. And I noticed even Carl Rove was applauding <laughs> her entrance there. We one of the earliest versions of this uh, um, was when I think mom was first getting the no notoriety that uh, she became known for uh, was a time, uh, and I wasn't there, but this is a story that's told when my parents were in uh, on, at broad on Broadway in New York for a performance of the uh, play Proof. And the story goes that they were walking down the aisle and everybody turned and started applauding. And my, my father leaned over and uh, said to my mother, I, I bet you didn't know that there was a convention of tax lawyers in town. <laughs> That's Eddie good. having been a leading tax lawyer. Right. Right. So I gather that would have been typical of his sense of humor. Yes. And his incredibly quick wit. That's great. That's great. Um, and your description of uh, lights going down and her crossing the uh, the orchestra to to get to her seat uh, certainly coincides with my experience having gone with her to uh, what as you say turned out to be the last uh, live opera performance that she saw Samson and Delilah uh, in in DC uh, I was here visiting and so got to be her date uh, to to the opera and it was indeed uh, exactly that, that uh, the, the whole house uh, stood up uh, to, to applaud, even though she was trying to be discreet. Uh, yeah. Nice try. Yeah. <laughs> she, she always, she would put her head down and just kind of, well, I have to say, I directed that production of Samson and Delilah, and I knew that she was coming after I had left because we were all, COVID was in the air, and we were all trying to get home and make sure that we were safe before things got locked down. So I'm sorry to have missed her um, visit for that, but I was there for many other productions that she attended and it was always, it was so gracious and so thoughtful. And I just have to say, I mean, how did she remember details? She knew who had directed what, who had sung in what. And I thought, does she do prep for this? Does she <laughs> did it? And I thought, no, I have a feeling she just, it's part of the random access memory in there that she, <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, which is incredible. Did you ever have opera chit chat? Was that like, what did you think of this? What did you, did you ever disagree um, uh, that she loved something and you hated it or you loved it and she hated it? Hmm. Does one okay. dare disagree with- I, I think she liked Wagner and I don't. Well, there right. you go. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. yeah. Well. She, she also in, uh, uh, I guess in, in uh, some kind of, excuse for her liking Wagner, uh, <laughs> did say that, that she thought that Wagner should have had a good editor. Yes. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> well, many people think that you don't need an excuse for liking Wagner, but there are probably just <laughs> um, And I, I, I go back and forth on that, but I, I do love me some Tristan and Isolde, uh, I have to say, and, um, and others and other things. So I want to thank both of you um, on behalf of the National Museum of American Jewish History for taking the time to share with us some personal and perhaps even unheard uh, stories about your mother and her connection both with social justice, equality, and opera. Thank you both so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So now we are going to have a uh, special treat, a uh, filmed tribute by the director of the Glimmerglass Festival, 
who uh, the artistic and general director of the Glimmerglass Festival, Francesca Zambello, uh, one of the leading stage directors of opera in the world, herself a formidable, formidable presence, a real force of nature, and you will figure that out in about 30 seconds when you hear her talk. Someone who was very close to the justice and who also spent time with her during her numerous visits to the Kennedy Center, where she would see productions at the Washington National Opera. So without further ado, I want to um, turn the afternoon over to Francesca Zambello. I was lucky to have met 
the indomitable RBG after a performance of Fidelio that I directed that took place in Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. in the early aughts. She loved the production. She wrote me a letter. And it was a, an incredibly complimentary piece. And I then reached out to her. And over the years, we became fast friends through opera. There is no question that the most famous fan of opera in America was RBG. She was a kind of spokesperson for it. She loved the music, she loved the stories, but also what's so interesting about so many opera plots is they are connected to law. There's always a contract, there's always a wrongdoing, and somehow I think those things spoke to her. Our friendship deepened when I took over the Glimmerglass Festival as the general director, and she would come every summer and give a talk about opera and law. We would present scenes from operas and she would discuss them whether it was Wotan and Loga from the Ring Cycle or Carmen doing the Segedia, which she called the ultimate plea bargaining. And so over the years, her visits to us created an incredible cult following here in central New York. People would come from all over just to see her. I then also decided that it would be great to try and get her on stage in a speaking role and so I invited her to the Washington National Opera, where I serve as artistic director, to perform the role of the Duchess of Krakenthorpe in Donizetti's rather delicious, funny comedy, The Daughter of the Regiment. She played the Duchess, who is the mother of a young man, and she has a very funny scene where she is working out a contract with the other mother of the girl that the intended is to marry. And the two of them banter, and she works out a pretty fierce little contract for her son. She was famous for her appearance in this piece because she was rolled out in a chair with her back to the audience. And as it turned around, her feet were dangling from the chair. And as it, the chair was turned around, a huge chair, the audience erupted into incredible laughter and an ovation. And at the end of the performance, which starred the great American tenor Lawrence Brownlee and soprano Lisette Oropesa, even they, their ovations were nothing like that one for RBG. I'll remember that moment forever. I know it meant so much to her. After she passed away, her daughter contacted me and said that the fan that RBG had used for the performance, she found in her personal items and she wanted me to have it. What was special about this fan was that she, RBG had written out all of her lines, all of her text, because she was afraid she would forget them on stage. Can you imagine the incredible mind, that incredible brain that tackled so many complex issues? Those things were in her brain but it was the theatrical lines that she was worried about. I'm fortunate to have been in her aura in some way and to have benefited so much from her friendship. She gave all of us so, so much, and I am eternally grateful to her for all that she did for our art form and, of course, in her work as a justice for the United States. Thanks so much to Francesca, a dear friend, and a, as I said, a true force of nature. And listen, in this court, I am not going to ever try to get away with anything. I certainly made a mistake because before we heard Francesca, we heard one of my favorite duets in all of opera, which is the Netta, Nanetta and Fenton duet from Falstaff, uh, which is Verdi's, uh, Verdi wrote two comedies, and this was his second one and the last opera he wrote when he was 80 years old. It's a fantastic piece. And in this piece, Nanetta is trying to avoid the arranged marriage her father has in mind with creepy Dr. Caius, since she prefers the young and handsome Fenton, as who wouldn't? So that was Ashley Marie Robillard and Josh Blue with Grant Lanig at the piano, followed by Francesca Zambello with her remarks about Justice Ginsburg. <laughs> 